Good morning, friends. Welcome, everyone. So good to have you here this morning. Welcome to all of you that are watching online. I don't feel like I've been up here for a long time because I haven't. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had our 20-year anniversary service. I'm still excited about that 20-year anniversary service. That was awesome. Um, then two weeks ago, I was at the launch of Westbury with Pastor Bill and the crew. They're in week three today, so let's keep them in prayer. And then last week, I was just on vacation. I was just away camping, which is not a vacation, by the way. Camping is the uh, the the, the most amount of work you will ever do going away. And by me, I mean my wife. So um, it's been a lot, but we've been in this series and I'm so glad to be able to jump in because this series is exploring the doubts that people sometimes have regarding God and the Christian faith and the Bible and its authenticity. And it's just such an important moment for us. I think this is one of those series that we get to build the foundation of everything that we do off of a moment like this. Now, in the first week of this series, series, um, Pastor John kind of outlined through Doubting Thomas the reality that doubt is part of all of our existence. It's part of our journey. Last week, Pastor Scott did an incredible job helping us to understand why we can trust the Word of God. So if you're wrestling with any of those, listen to the last two weeks. And being this is my first week jumping into this series, um, when God put this series on my heart, a couple months ago for us to go through in October, I started to think through a really, really important moment in my life. Uh, there was a point in my life when I doubted tremendously uh, the, the basic foundation of what we know as, as uh, traditional Christianity. But here was the catch. I wasn't 16. I wasn't 19. I was in my late 20s and already pastoring this church. Can you imagine how hard that is? going through a season of doubt when you're a pastor, pastoring people. The church was young. We only had a, a couple hundred, if that, 150 people at the time. But, but I, I think a lot of people who grow up as Christians often get to this moment where they start to wonder, okay, I've always believed this. It's always been the foundation of my life. But suddenly you have this moment for whatever reason that kind of rocks you. And you're like, man, do I really believe what I believe? Or has it just always been part of my tradition, my history, my life? And so I started to go through this, this moment of crisis, legit crisis, and here was my deal to myself. I would not let it creep out to the church that I was pastoring, being center point at the time. I, I said, no matter where I am right now, I will teach everything that I've always believed, but I have to wrestle with this because I need to know, can I keep going on as a pastor? Can I keep going on in this role with my understanding? And the thing is, who do you turn to when you're the pastor struggling, right? Right? Uh, who, who do you talk to about some of the things that you're wrestling with and trying to understand? And it wasn't the, the deity of Jesus or uh, um, can I rely on the Bible, but there was parts of the Christian faith that I, I still just didn't know if this was true or not. Uh, so I called my old Nyack college professor, Ron Woldburn, and I got together with Ron, and we had follow-up phone conversations after that. And, and I'll tell you what I loved is when I met with Ron, he didn't yell at me. Ron didn't look at me and say, you're a failure, Ron didn't say, get out of the church, you heathen. Ron said, man, this is normal. We all have these moments. Uh, let me walk with you. Let me share my experience of my past doubts and the things that I had wrestled with. And he gave me the space to share about what I was really going through. And then he helped me to intellectually reason and biblically reason with the stuff I was wrestling with, only to come out on the other side thinking even stronger and believing even stronger what I had believed before I went into that period. That's not always the case, but I, I know that that was such a pivotal moment for me as I'm building the foundation of the rest of my life and ministry came back to this season that I wrestled with some doubt. And that's why we're teaching this series because we know that most of us, not everyone, but most of us are going to go through a moment of maybe disillusionment with our faith and understanding of who God is. And we want to give you the proper place and building blocks to know that you can move forward in that here at center point. And that is part of the journey. Amen. Does that make sense, friends? So today we're talking about when in doubt regarding Jesus. Obviously, Jesus is the center of Christianity. It is all about him. Amen. Do we love Jesus here at Center Point? Come on. And I don't know if you know this or not, but the Bible makes a big deal about Jesus. Have you picked up on that? He's kind of the star of the show here. 
And the Bible makes huge claims about Jesus. He is God. He is part of the Trinity. He's not just a born creation. He is there since all of time. He's, he's God. The Bible makes a claim that he died for the sins of the world in a way that no one else could ever do. And that he rose from the dead and he is alive now today. Those are some pretty big claims, aren't they? But all of this leads to the obvious question. Can we believe all of these things about Jesus? Can we believe the Bible's testimony about him? It's not like back in the day someone was taking TikTok videos of Jesus' miracles, right? That'd be kind of cool, having a video of Jesus walking on water. I'd be like, that is so good. I needed that today, right? So why should we believe this? Well, now, last week we went into why we can trust in the Bible, but, but let's kind of unpack this specifically as we talk about the personhood of Jesus. And I, I want to begin with a, a passage of Scripture from the Apostle Paul to the Church of Corinth where he is writing to them about their very doubts about who Jesus is. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, sorry, starting at verse 1. Our slide people just got nervous. Verse 8, no. Slide 1, guys, don't worry. This is what it says. And I'm going to kind of break it apart and take a little section at a time. He says, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Let me give some context for this passage. Uh, Paul wants to remind the Corinth Christians about the gospel, about the good news of Jesus. He wants to remind them of what they have been taught since the beginning, uh, what they've built this church on, built their foundation of their life and their faith upon. And what has happened is some false teachers have crept into the church of Corinth. And these false teachers were denying the physical resurrection of Jesus. They're like, yeah, he died for our sins and all that, but, but th there was no actual physical resurrection. Uh, the thing that I find interesting about that is people denying the resurrection is nothing new. That's not a, a 2022 issue. Uh, that has been going on since the very early church. And what was happening is uh, they were either saying that Jesus didn't actually rise from the dead or the resurrection was just like a spiritual resurrection. Jesus didn't come back in the, the flesh. He just kind of like came back as a ghost Jesus saying hi to everyone. You know, he, he wasn't physical. Like he was raised from the dead in our hearts, but not in the real world. And so Paul has his work cut out for him because he knows the importance of Jesus coming back and being raised from the dead. He needs to show the church that they can really believe that this had happened, that it is critical to understanding our faith in the personhood of Christ. Why is this such a big deal? Because the resurrection is, is crucial to the truthfulness of Christianity. It's crucial to the truthfulness of Christianity because if the resurrection isn't true, then in many ways Christianity is a huge waste of time. It, it, it's, it's missing its, its meat and its authority and what the word of God says about it. Because if Jesus isn't alive, then Christianity at the end of the day isn't actually true. Uh, you can't just discard the resurrection and end up in the same place that we teach you week after week about who Jesus is. All of our future hope is based on this resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection that we too will have as well. And we're going to get a bit more into that in a moment. Let's continue as Paul makes his case. Look at verse 3. He says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And here, Paul lays out the good news of salvation as simply put as possible. He's saying, here's the deal, here's the gospel, here, here is what we've proclaimed, here's what I taught you when I first came to you. This is the deal. And this is actually one of the earliest Christian confessions that we are reading right now. 
we assume that the book of 1 Corinthians was written in roughly 55 A.D. Remember, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection happened roughly at 33 A.D., And most scholars believe that Paul is taking these words that were from one of these early church confessions, one of the earliest confessions that the church had that was kind of universal for that early church. And that's why he keeps saying from the scriptures. And and here we have this moment that he's saying this is what it is to be a Christian. It's always been for the last 20 years since the resurrection of Jesus, this is what we've been saying. The message hasn't changed. This is the earliest confession that we have and it is that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose from the dead on the third day. In other words, the resurrection has always been part of the Christian faith. It wasn't an add-on later. It wasn't an a, a, a addition down the road. Like this has been what it was since day one. And then... Paul shares a little bit more to help prove his point. He goes into people's experience. Look at this. 15, starting in verse 5. Paul then says, hey guys, let me tell you. Let me tell you about Jesus. Remember this. Jesus then appeared, appeared to Cephas. And then to the 12, being the disciples. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of whom are still living. Though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. He he, uh, is kind of an apostle after the fact, unlike the others. And Paul goes to great detail to show uh, all these appearances of Jesus that occurred after the resurrection. And he does this to show that Jesus actually physically rose from the dead. There are all of these first account witnesses of it. So let's look at this post resurrection appearance as he mentions, because I, I, I think it's fascinating. He says, first there was Cephas. This is, this is Peter. Uh, then to the 12, the 12 disciples. This is the account that we looked at at week one with Doubting Thomas that Pastor John taught. This is that moment. Then over 500 people at once. And remember, they, they don't have projectors. Okay, they, they, they don't have um, good, um, um, you know, movie magic that they can kind of shape someone into someone else. Like, Jesus has appeared, and 500 people look at him like, it's Jesus. They all see and they all know at once. And he's saying, in essence, listen, if, if you don't believe me, most of these people are still alive. Paul said they're still alive. So if you don't believe me, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to Jerusalem. Or I want you to go to these other towns where they've now spread out a little bit. I want you to go ask them because they have actually seen Jesus in their lifetime. First account stories. James, Jesus' brother, who actually rejected Jesus before the resurrection, now is a believer He didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. He rejected this truth of Jesus, but now it's saying because of this interaction with Jesus after the resurrection, now he's a believer in who Christ is. All the apostles, there's a larger group than the 12 that make up the full breadth of the apostles of the early church. And then finally to Paul on the road to Damascus. And this is Paul's evidence for the resurrection. Here's his point. Jesus really rose from the dead. Amen? He rose from the dead. That this actually happened in human history. That this is not a fairy tale. It is not a story. It is not someone that a a spiritual person created one day when uh, they were a little too drunk in a basement writing it down. Like this happened. But this does lead us to a fair question. How do we know we can believe what Paul is saying? How do we know that we can believe all this? After all, 2,000 years ago is a pretty long time. Is anyone here about 2,000 years old? I feel like I'm 2,000 years old lately. I don't know about you, but 2,000, that's a long time. Can we really trust what the Bible, which may be a little biased, has to say about Jesus? It makes sense that people would have doubts about Jesus. Isn't that fair to say? It makes sense. People are like, ah, all right, be a little slow here. I hear about your Christianity and your Jesus raised from the grave. Like, I, I, I've got some doubts. So what I want to do is I want to address a few big questions that I know if you're skeptical, you probably either have had or currently have about him and about the resurrection. 
And I think if we're, we're going to take this seriously, I think the first thing we actually kind of need to do is step out of the Bible for a moment. Uh, um, we, we know, all right, maybe the Bible's biased. So let's step out of the Bible for a moment. Let's, let's kind of look at this from this bigger picture. What is the historical evidence for Jesus outside the Bible? What's the historical evidence for Jesus outside the Bible? Now, again, we could go forever on this very point. Um, we're just going to give you a snapshot of some things that you can ask us about. We have a resource page uh, at centerpoint.com. Uh, it's cpchurch.com slash resources. Like we, we have a lot more out there. I can't cover all of it in the sermon. So I'm going to give you just the cliff note version of the stuff that we've been studying and reading. And have, some of us spent decades learning, okay? And here's this first one, this evidence outside the Bible. Because for many years, people would doubt whether or not Jesus was ever a real person who actually existed. There was, uh, there was some debate. Um, couldn't these guys have just made up? Couldn't the Apostle Paul, he was just this really brilliant Pharisee. Couldn't have he just like come up with this? He wanted to make his own religion, and he just kind of went with it. He just took the story and ran. And people would claim that everything in the Bible about Jesus was actually fabricated. That there was never a real person ever in history that was this Jesus. But here's the thing. In, in 2022, with all the archaeological um, facts and information and scrolls that have been discovered and put together and looked at, there is no credible historian that believes that this man, Jesus, never existed. That's just not true. Any credible historian looks at all the evidence that is out there and, and says, okay, there was, in fact, a man named Jesus that started this revolution that we define as Christianity. Even credible historians, some are Christian, but many are not, believe that Jesus was in fact this real person. This isn't just pastors and Christians, but actual historians, secular historians. And what do they believe? And why do they believe that? Well, you have to see that there are so many ancient historical sources outside of the Bible that talk about Jesus and then talk about this, this wild group, this revolutionary um, sect of Judaism that becomes Christianity that have nothing to do from Scripture. And these sources date back as far as the first century, right when it happened, all the way to the fifth century. And many of these sources are quite hostile towards Christianity. They actually don't like Christianity. If they had one goal, it would be to disprove Christianity. Yet they're saying, no, but something real did happen here. That there really was this man named Jesus, last name Christ. That's not actually his last name, but sometimes it feels like it, doesn't it? But there was this man, and they give us proof that Jesus existed. So he certainly existed as a human being. And from these non-Christian sources, this is actually what we learn about Jesus, all right? This is, again, not scripture. These are non-Christian sources. Uh, you can do your own research on this, but this is what historical evidence has shown us, not the Bible, that Jesus was a real man from Palestine, that he allegedly was born of a virgin, like that right off the bat was an understanding of him, that he um, lived a wise and virtuous life, that he was known for performing miracles, that he was crucified in Palestine under Pontius Pilate, uh, that this happened during the Jewish Passover and he was mocked as the king of the Jews, that he was believed by his disciples to be raised from the dead after three days. They're not saying that they believe it, but they're saying there's evidence that these disciples believed it, that his his followers partook in unusual feasts where they symbolically ate his flesh and drank his blood. We know that is communion. That the disciples spread his story all over the known world and that his followers denied polytheism and worshipped Jesus simply as God, as one God, the triune God. Hear me, all of that information that we know is biblical information, can be proven through different things that other historians and other writings have been created that had nothing to do from Christianity. Isn't that wild to think about? So when someone tells you there's no proof about Jesus, be like, you have never done your research. You've watched some random YouTube video with some guy who knows nothing and just wants to live his life however he wants. That's where that ultimately comes from because the proof is there. 
and looking at everything we can learn about Jesus from these sources outside the Bible. This can give us confidence that what we read about Jesus in the Bible, as Christians, we can say, yeah, there, there is absolutely truth here. Because if Jesus really made the impact on the world that the Bible claims he made, then we would expect evidence of this outside of the Bible. And it's there. It is present. We have it. Because this was a huge deal that changed human history in the world as we know it. The evidence is present. Now, this still leaves us with the most controversial aspect of the life of Jesus. So we can historically prove there was a man named Jesus. This whole movement started as a result of him, that these things were believed, at least by his disciples, even if you don't believe it. Like, this was all present. But the thing that it still leaves us with is, what about the resurrection? Like, can you really believe that this guy came back to life three days later, all on his own, on his own power. Now, ancient sources do affirm that Jesus lived and was crucified, but they also affirm that his followers, if nothing else, did believe that he had been raised from the dead. But is there other evidence outside of his followers who may again be biased, may have an agenda to, to say like, yeah, this actually happened? I think so, and I think there's a lot. And let me give you some, um, some points. Some of them are simply logical. Others of them are, are a little bit more historic that, that this did, in fact, happen. And first, let me start with this. Jesus definitely did die on the cross. He definitely died on the cross. Now, I say this because in the past, I was talking to one of our pastors, Pastor Bob, about this earlier. There was even a whole book about this whole idea that Jesus faked his death. Like, he got one over on the Romans, and, you know, he had this whole thing. There have been claims that Jesus faked his death on the cross, and he only made it appear that he had died. This is pretty implausible, though, when you really think about the scenario. You know, the Romans were pros at executing people. They did two things really well, all right? Taxing people and killing people. Like, they were the ultimate government of control. Like, they knew what they were doing. They were pro-executing. And if the Romans knew how to kill people, trust me, as Jesus was up on that cross in this public setting where everyone in the city was watching, this would have been a hard one to fake. Jesus couldn't have survived being flogged, being nailed to a cross, having a spear in his side. No, Jesus died, and the Roman officials, trust me, made sure, because it was in their best interest, made sure that he was definitively dead. Again, historians, historians of all types, Christians, non-Christians, atheists, they believe that Jesus had died on the cross. So yeah, Jesus absolutely died. Secondly, the testimony of the female disciples. I find this interesting. Is why we, we can know that this is true. The Bible tells us that the first disciples to find that the tomb was empty were some female disciples. And this is remarkable historically because in the first century, and ladies, don't get mad at me, all right? This, this isn't my century. I'm not telling you this is good or not. But, but in the first century, the testimony of women would never be used in court because women were considered second-class citizens, they, they weren't seen as equal to men. Um, again, that's not me saying that. That is just the truth of 2,000 years ago in Rome. And here, here's why I bring that up. Um, the, the Bible was written by Christians. Now, if you wanted to give proof and you wanted people to really believe this, here's what you would not do. You would not put people on the stand that couldn't give a testimony in court and be taken seriously. If you're making this whole thing up, if you're just coming up with, with your own story, here's what you're going to do. You're going to be like, wow, you know what? Peter, he showed up there with John, and they found the tomb empty. You can trust these guys. They're good guys. They're credible guys, but they're men. And you can take their word seriously, but no, it's fascinating who shows up first. It says also a lot about the importance of women in the church that I don't have time to get into right now, but... But you see that there was these women who showed up. And, and I want you to think about that. If you're making up a story about the resurrection, why would you use a group of women? As opposed to people that would be more considered credible in the moment. You wouldn't. Yet that's exactly how it happened. And so that is how it is recorded. Third, 
the testimony of the eyewitnesses. Now, we've already covered this a little in 1 Corinthians 15, but, but after the resurrection, I want you to think about how many people saw Jesus. Again, historians of all types believe that these people saw, at least who they thought was Jesus. They believed that the disciples believed that they had seen the risen Christ. And not one or two people saw Jesus hundreds, probably five to 700 people at least saw Jesus. They saw him. Some got to touch him. And there's all these instances of people that had this encounter with the risen Christ. Let me ask you, how many testimonies would you need to hear to believe a credible story? Now, we live in a day and age of fake news, right? Like, we are all skeptical of everything at this point. I don't know about you. I hear any news article I read, I don't believe it at first. Anyone else? Are you at that point like I am? Like, I, I don't care if it's CNN or Fox. I mean, everyone has an agenda, right? Like, everyone is pushing their story, their version. They'll leave out a little, a little bit here so it makes this look worse. Like, everyone is doing it. It's, we're so polarized. We have so much information, so much misinformation. The internet has now made us not believe anything that is going on there. And we just live in a day of complete skepticism of everything. And I get that. And it's, it's affected my mind and heart and soul too. I know it has you as well. And so when we hear something at first, we're like, I don't believe it. <laughs> just right off the bat, I don't believe it. All right, what if two people told you, like, hey, they both saw it. Like, I know people have bad memories. Well, how was the lighting? I've seen enough cop shows and CSI, right? And that, that person actually is nearsighted and you just didn't know that yet. I see how the show ends up at the end, so I need more than two. I need like five, five credible people. Now I'll start to believe that they actually saw it. Maybe 10, uh, maybe 30 with some video evidence. I, I need to see it myself. Like we, we're just so cynical and I get that, but I want you to hear this. How many people would you need to say, I saw this and they tell it to you when you're finally like, okay, I have to at least be really open to that's how it happened. And that's why Paul writes what he writes in 1 Corinthians 15, because he's letting them know, guys, look at how many people have actually seen the risen Savior. So much so that that's how this entire thing started. It wasn't just the, the, the word of a few. It wasn't just the apostles and the 12, or at this point, 11. It was so many that no one that was open to it could actually deny. They believe, at least if nothing else, that they saw Jesus. That something had happened. And they'd met someone who was exactly like him, who spoke like him and shared like him and had the holes in his hands and his feet like him. And, and we have to believe this. So much so that it changed their entire life. Friends, this is either the greatest case of mass hysteria that the world has ever known, or they all saw the risen Lord. And as such... This is what happens. And this is another point why I think that we can take this credibly because it changed the lives of the disciples. The fourth point is that it changed the lives of the disciples. Think about this. After the crucifixion, what happened to the disciples? They were all terrified. Jesus died. Everyone is hiding. Peter is denying. People are running away. They're like, I never knew Jesus. Well, I wasn't part of that crew. Uh-uh, no, no, no. That wasn't me at all. No, I, I want nothing to do with this man named Jesus. They're cowarding, they're hiding, they're running away. They're afraid that they could be hung up next, that they could die next, then in a short amount of time, they're transformed into a group of fearless public witnesses for the message of Jesus. Why'd that happen? They stayed strong in the face of opposition from their Jewish culture. They were kicked out of their synagogues, they're imprisoned by Rome, and they grew from a handful in Jerusalem to a worldwide movement we had today. What changed? I'll tell you what changed. Two things changed. One, they saw the resurrected Jesus. I mean, how freaked out would you be? Think about how that would change you if suddenly your Savior, who you've been with this whole time, who now you thought was defeated, suddenly rose from the dead. How would you be if you had doubt, if you were shaky? Would you be like, yeah, I still don't believe it. You know, I'm, yeah, okay. Finger through the, the hole there in your hand. Like, I don't know. I don't believe it. No. You see the risen Jesus and you're like, you are real. Woo! <laughs> There's no question. 
That's not something you leave and you're like, oh, I'm kind of iffy about. I don't think I'm gonna give my whole life to everything you said because now you know everything you said was absolutely true. You're forever changed in that moment. Like this is the man who's loved me, who's walked with me, who's taught me, and he is in fact my savior. And even then they were still scared, but they were still together. They were moving forward. Then the day of Pentecost came when the presence of the Holy Spirit started filling all of those that were filled, uh, that put their faith in Christ. And now they're empowered as well by the power of God. But the resurrection to the day of Pentecost, that changed everything. They went from being terrified to being the most bold, I don't care if you kill me, people the world has ever seen. You can't look at that and just blow that off because this is historically true. Now the resurrection changed who they were. And now as a result, the fifth thing I want you to see is these disciples now have a willingness to even die for their faith. Some have claimed that disciples made up the resurrection. Like, they're like hey guys, all right, we need a new Ponzi scheme. We've invested the last three years of our life in this, right? Religion can make money, right? A little bank right here. Why, why don't we just franchise this baby, right? Let's, let's take this thing. Let, here's a crazy idea. Jesus rose from the dead. <gasps> and let's run with it. Let's like make this happen. We'll become famous and powerful. TMZ will be on us. Let's do it. We got this. And some have claimed that the disciples made it up. Yet think about it. How unlikely does this actually seem, even for non-Christians, when you realize that these are the same men all now willing to die for their faith? And not even just them, but all the other disciples that have seen Jesus as well. You know, church history tells us that 11 out of the 12 disciples were martyred, were killed for their faith. John, the one who was able to at least die of old age, was imprisoned and tortured until he finally was home with Jesus. How many people do you know that are willing to die for something they know is a lie? Like how far would you be willing to go for something like, I got some really good profit coming from this? Until there's the moment where the, there's a gun to your head, a cross to your body, a noose to your neck, where you're like, whoa, 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 it was, it was fun while it lasted, but yes, I recant. I take it back. Like, it, I, 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 yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not willing to die for this lie. Like, most people are not willing to go to that extent for something they know is a great con. Yet that's exactly what the disciples were willing to do. And it's more likely that once the third of death showed up that the disciples, and not even just the 11 that are remaining, but all of these disciples would start making a confession that we made up the story. We were all in on it. Please don't kill me. Yeah, that's not what happened. And then there was over 500 people that backed this lie whose lives were now ruined. Remember, the early church was not like, was not like today. Like, are you comfortable in your chairs are you comfortable at home? I know you're comfortable at home. Get here. <laughs> I know you're comfortable. You can have a comfortable Christianity in America. Can you not? Like, this is not bad. You got some great music. You get a short message, not like when I grew up. I mean, we keep it to 35 minutes, maybe 40 today. Growing up, you had like four hours of sermons. Is it comfortable? That, that was not the early church. Like you were, you were ostracized. You were removed from your family. You were shunned. You were shamed. And they were all willing to do this for a lie? That makes no sense? Because you're not gaining anything outside of the true fact that Jesus is their Savior. Like you gain nothing from this but pain. And over 500 people are like, I'm in. I'm that masochistic enough. I love it. No. You're not going to find that. And these friends and these people died for what they believed. They changed as a result of this truth. Six, and finally, the empty tomb. I think in my mind, there's one simple way that the Romans or the Pharisees could have just ended this whole thing. That was a pain in their butt. They did not like this. This was not good for them. They had a lot of other things to worry about, right? They're still trying to take their taxes and have their control and all their other stuff. Like this, this isn't good for anyone at the time. It's not good for Rome. It's not good for the Pharisees. There's one simple thing that they could have done to stop Christianity right in its tracks, and that's produce a body. It's like, hey, guys, I know you think he's alive, but guess what? What's behind door number one? <laughs> a corpse would have changed everything. 
And this would have forever shown everyone that the resurrection was untrue, but no one could produce Jesus' body because it was gone. And it could have simply been stolen. Like this is no big deal. Because this was a tomb, a rock-solid tomb. There was Roman guards who were there to guard the tomb. And if anything happened, by the way, to the body in the tomb, there's a good chance these Roman guards would be murdered. <laughs> like they have a lot at stake here to make sure this didn't happen. And not only that, but there's this large stone guarding it that no one could simply push away, at least not discreetly, with guards right there. And there was a seal upon it. No, the only plausible explanation is that the tomb is empty because Jesus rose from the dead. Amen, church? Because he rose. Now, can you find crazy theories to go against everything I just said? Absolutely, you can. They're out there. They're beautiful creative minds out there. We've had 2,000 years of coming up with reasons to doubt the resurrection of Jesus. Yet I would argue if you're at least just being open and logical with the information presented and you look at it, there are way too many reasons for you to at least be open to the fact that the resurrection did happen. This thing that has changed the world in incredible ways. All we learned about the scripture last week and how it is absolutely something divine and supernatural, how it was all tied together and made, that this is not just a faith for the dumb, but it's also a faith for the intellectual the reasoning human being that has a mind and an IQ and looks at it and says, no, there is absolutely something here I must wrestle with because there's way too much evidence to simply blow it off. It's logical to look at history and say, okay, I need to technically wrestle with this, but I want to leave you with one last thought. I don't want you to just believe in the resurrection as some interesting fact that has happened. I want you to see the resurrection as the most important thing that could ever happen in your life as well. Romans 4, 25 says this, he who delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justifications. Talking about Jesus. That Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification, making us right before God. And I want everyone in this room today to know or remember that Jesus died and rose from the dead for a very specific purpose. It wasn't just to show off what God can do. It was to save us from our sin. He died so that you wouldn't have to. He died for your spiritual death. He died in your place. And Jesus was raised from the dead so that you and I might be saved. In fact, the reason the Gospels were written down was so that we might believe in Jesus over 2,000 years later and have enough evidence to say, this is how much God loves me, that Jesus did this for me. John 20, 31 says this, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Friends, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus died on a cross for your sin. And if you put your faith in him and ask for forgiveness for the sin in your life, the resurrection of Jesus becomes the resurrection of your life. And I'll tell you one last reason why I believe in the resurrection of Jesus after all the facts is because I've given my life to Jesus and I personally have been trained transformed by Jesus. I've experienced his resurrection in my life. I'm a different person as a result of him. And I know he's real because I've felt him. I've experienced him. I've known his love in my own life and I've known his forgiveness in my own life. So I would encourage you, don't leave here today or stop watching today until you have said yes to Jesus. Amen, church. Amen. Can we thank Christ for who he is and what he's done? I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to call the worship team up. And I want to give you, whether you're in this room or you're at home right now, I want to give you a moment to respond to the resurrection of Jesus. We haven't done this, I don't think, in a few weeks. So I, I just feel like this is that moment that we need to give you the opportunity to let your life be forever changed. So with every eye shut and every head bowed, if you want the resurrection of Jesus to be the resurrection of your own heart and soul in this moment, if you want to go from death to life, 
If you want this gift of forgiveness so that you can have a right relationship with God, I I want you to, to say these words with me, whether out loud or just in your mind and your heart. Simply say, Jesus, I come to you now. And I thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Jesus, forgive me. Now show me how to live for you. I just want to ask, with every eye still shut and head bowed, if you've said that prayer for the first time, that you've given your life over to Christ right now, will you just raise your hand so that I can see what God's been doing in this room today? Amen. Amen. I want you to know I saw six hands go up. Can we thank God for those six hands? And so whether you're in this room or you're online, if you're online, hear me, and you said that prayer, I want you to connect with Pastor Brett or in the chat, direct prayer someone so we can tell you more about it. If you're in this room, I'd love for you to go in the back and ask someone on our prayer team or someone at Connect Point how to take the next steps to grow in your understanding and your faith with Christ. Church, we thank you so much for being here. Can we close in worshiping and praising our God, our living God, our risen God today for who he is and what he has done. Let's worship together.